Celts needed to buy a vowel here and there, but it is pronounced for Ireland, it's pronounced sour. For Wales, it's pronounced Sowin. For Scotland, it's pronounced Sabin. And for America, it's pronounced pumpkin spice. <laughs> <laughs> In more serious terms, the holiday itself was a Celtic festival held somewhere between the 31st of October and the 1st of November. We're not quite sure. Their calendar doesn't line up with ours. It's more an astrological calendar. It fell between the seasonal equinoxes and was the beginning of the harvest and also the beginning of winter. It's also being a long night seen as the death of the year. Now, the Celts did it backwards. They, we go with the birth of the new year. They did it, their new year happened on the death of the old year. That same night was supposed to be the night where ghouls and spirits of the dead, and particularly the she, which is, once again, they need to buy a vowel. But <laughs> that's how that's pronounced. We would call them fairies. Elves, they're out to wander the night as they see fit. This can be good, and this usually is horrible. <laughs> there are wandering travelers throughout the land, and most of them, some of them, may be gods in disguise. These things can ruin your life for the year, so you would make sure there was an extra place set at your table on that night. No traveler could be turned away just in case they weren't who they looked like. Clearly, we're all people. We understand everybody took advantage of this, right? <laughs> uh, and so it became more of a tradition that way. Now, I did mention the sheep and the fairies. Um, one of the more persistent legends that wandered through Germany, Spain, the Celtic regions, of Ireland, Wales, is the Wild Hunt. This is a variation on, well, travelers and other fairies can, and ghosts can wander around and visit. The Wild Hunt has another purpose. They roam the countryside in a pound of herd of ghostly horses, usually with a pack of vicious ghost hounds. They're black with red ears. And if they catch you, on an open road, they <clears throat> proceed to hunt you relentlessly. If you can get to safety, usually by crossing a river, you can often get away. If they catch you, however, you get torn apart and turned into one of the hounds and join the hunt for the next year. And there for <coughs> Yeah, not great, but <laughs> nonetheless. Legends like these get changed and mutated over time. They turn into our traditions. And one of those, one of the ones most associated with Halloween, is the jack o -Lan. Now, some of you might be surprised to know that the original jack o lanterns weren't pumpkins. In fact, pumpkins are native to the Americas. They don't show up in Europe until 1500s, give or take, the traditional jack-o'-lantern was this, the turnip. We thought about having a turnip carving contest, but we didn't know where we'd find turnips, but anyway. <laughs> the legend of the jack-o'-lantern is also one of those stories that show up, and you can feel the influence of history on this story. Uh, my favorite one is a story of a guy named Jack, who was a, to put it as legend says, a near-do-well. He was a drunk, a gambler, a thief, pretty much everything, but he was clever about it. During an encounter where he is about to die, Satan shows up and is there to claim his soul in the moment of his death. But Jack makes a bet with Satan and wins. Prize, he, gets, he makes Satan promise he will never take his soul. This is all well and good, but Jack gets old and he dies, as all things do. 
and when he dies, guaranteed not to go to hell, he goes to heaven. But they won't let him in because he's Jack. <laughs> and he's done horrible, horrible things. So he goes to hell because he has no place to go and no place to rest. But Satan tells him, nope, not welcome here either. Jack is then doomed to wander the earth forever, looking for a place to go. And on the night of Samhain, he's able to make himself known, possibly gaining himself a little company. Now, where does the lantern come in? As he's complaining that he has nowhere to go, Satan, in generosity or sarcasm, gives him a coal from hell. Jack puts it too hot to carry. Jack puts it in a turnip, and that becomes his eternal lantern lighting his way so see, even the origins of this are just ghost stories. By the way, if you're really interested, you might notice in folklore the name Jack continuously shows up in legend after legend after legend, and fairy tale after fairy tale. Is it the same guy? Maybe. Or people, or Jack's just easy to say. One or the other. Uh, Bonfires are also one of these traditions that have lasted forever. Anybody go to a bonfire this year? A couple of you? The structure of the bonfire is a way to stand against the dark one more time as the nights get longer and longer and you become more and more isolated from the weather, from a lack of company, from purpose, on and on until Christmas. And that's another lecture, but I can ruin Christmas for you if you like. <laughs> Move forward away from the Celtic people. Halloween is made up of its parts, and the Romans have an influence. The Romans have a talent here. As they invade, as they move in, they conquer the Celtic realms. About 40. 43 AD, give or take. And as they do, the Romans have this skill. They love to appropriate pieces of other people's cultures, the parts that work for them, and incorporate them into their own. That is not a one-way street. When the Romans arrive, they not only take ideas away from the Celtic people, they add things to the Celtic tradition. And this holiday, Samhain, interacts with uh, the rituals of Pomona, which happen about the same time. Another harvest goddess from the Romans. Pomona is the goddess of fruit, and trees particularly happy. And there's a specific ritual that you follow when you are worshiping Pomona. I'm willing to bet that most of you have participated in this religious rite at one point in your lives. They you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so even the games we play are distortions of ancient traditions. Of course, we have the Christian influence on the, the holiday as well. As Christianity spread, they take their cues from the Romans, and it's much easier to get people interested in your religion if you share some holidays. While there is a no Christian holiday directly associated with the ritual and the principles of Samhain, they make one. In the seventh century, Pope Gregory declares All Saints Day on November 1st, and October 31st is All Hallows Eve. November 2nd is All Souls Day. Some of these still stick around. We'll talk about how that happens in a minute. And this tradition continues in the 16th century. Christian children would dress up in horrible costumes depicting the horrific deaths of saints because, let's face it, little boys are going to be little boys no matter what era it is. Girls do. And they dance around doing the dance macabre to commemorate, supposedly, the deaths of saints, but really it's just having fun. These traditions stick with us. And they don't change much. They come and they go and they fade, but we're here 
now. I'm talking about Halloween, not Samhain. Which brings us to the 1800s. We fast forward to America. A massive influx of immigration happens. People show up at our shores, coming to Ellis Island, bringing their foods, their religions, their traditions. And they all separate into ethnic neighborhoods, but the Irish in particular, very much. The idea of guising, disguising oneself, dressing up, became more and more common. Well, I mean, how could it not, right? Let's say you're in New York, you're seeing the Irish kids in Hell's Kitchen go out, dress up, and get free food. The kids next door go, why can't I do that? And they, the Irish kids go, I don't know, why don't you do that? And off they go. But it never really takes off. It never sticks until we have a specific moment in American history that kind of triggers a deeper participation. Yeah, I heard that gasp. Yeah, that's been pretty bad, aren't they? These are some of the Harold. You have postcards with children showing Halloween. There's no mention of trick or treat until 1927. That happens in Wisconsin. But why Wisconsin? I don't know. But Wisconsin nonetheless. It doesn't become widespread across the country until the 1930s. Some of you can guess why. It's the Great Depression. It's a way for children to get treats that they could never afford, and that their parents could never give them during the Depression. And with that, there's no, there's no stigma of charity. It's a holiday, after all. It's the way things work. It sticks here. But this is America. Most additional Halloween costumes look like this. They're ghosts, goblins, ghouls. I, I think some of them should still look like this, but that's just me. Uh, but in America, every subject came to be represented. Anybody know the number one genre of movie in the 1930s? Yeah. Dracula, Frankenstein, they stick. Invisible Man, although that one's hard to pull off. Uh, <laughs> they're all part of American tradition, which, for me, shows where we stand now. America, this Halloween's evolved into a secular holiday. There's no religious significance to it. It's not even actually a traditional holiday. The banks are open, schools are open. I disagree with that particularly. But. <laughs> It's celebrated through the United States one way or the other. Americans spend roughly 11 billion on the holiday in 2022. And this year proves it's trending to be higher. Three billion in candy alone, on average $30 a household. Yes, I know. I spend $30 on candy. I did it before then and have to spend another $30 on candy. I understand. I've been there before. An average of 50 million trick-or-treaters between the ages of 5 and 14 will participate every year, and 70,000 acres of pumpkins are harvested. A little over $700 million in pumpkins. This is, by the way, the third most expensive holiday in, in America. Everybody knows the first, right? It's Christmas. Anybody got a guess in the second? Yeah, it's Thanksgiving. It's food. We spend a lot of money on food. Not by much, though. It's only like 13 million, give or take. So Halloween's catching up. 13. So, <laughs> all of this goes to my hypothesis that Halloween is still evolving. It's still moving. The Day of the Dead on November 1st and 2nd. See, I told you I'd talk about All Saints Day again. Here it is. This 
holiday is Mexican in origin, but it goes older than that. It actually has its origins with the Aztecs. And it was incorporated into celebrations, the Christian celebrations of the Spanish later on. And it's a pretty good holiday. The Day of the Dead is not designed to mourn the dead. It is actually a party involving the dead. It is a day to remember all the happy memories of the people you lost throughout the year. They decorate tombstones, they visit, they have conversations, they have parties in their honor. That is the nature of things. And because of the nature of immigration in this country over the past several decades, the Day of the Dead is becoming part of the system. Halloween is closer to a two-day holiday now than it ever has been in our past. Me. Halloween is the most American holiday. I can hear a couple of you, you know who you are, sneering right now, holding your tongues, but my case is this. Yes, we have the 4th of July. Yes, that every country has their own version of Independence Day. They're all rather similar, really. But this, Halloween, this is us. This is everything we do. It is the Celts. It is the Romans. It is the Christians of all denominations. It is immigration in a nutshell. Even now, evolving immigration. It is our culture integrated into a holiday. And it continuously changes and man maneuvers with us. It's us. We like being scared. We like creepy things. And for me, that makes this the best holiday. Although we should still get the day off. So, that being said, we're going to take a slight break at this point. Before we do, what we're going to do after the break is what some of you are here for. Real historical horror stories. Actual factual based ones that you prove you don't actually have to make up ghost stories to be creepy. So, but we have to reward the students who put in hard work into their uh, pumpkins this time around. So, if you would all see this kids right here and grab a ticket. Choose your pumpkin and place it in the appropriate bag, or we can do it for you if you're feeling particularly lazy. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it, and we'll announce the winner a little later, and then we'll move on to the next part. And by the way, I will also entertain questions uh, as my students are now rolling their eyes, like, of course you will. But uh, I'll entertain questions afterwards. and. We'll cover whatever ground you all want to talk about. Right? I'm going to turn the stage over to you. Oh, I try to cover my
good? Awesome. Let's do this thing. Do not be distracted by the woman behind the curtain. Um. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. Let's get creepy. Let's talk about some no. These are in loose chronological order, so let us start. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta back up. You asked me to do it two minutes ago, and I did it. Or I can do it. No, I got it. Um, I must mention the committee that, uh, or Arts and Lectures, that stepped up and helped organize all of this and provided the individual campus prize support. I also have to mention the Rome State Foundation that provided the grand prize for all of this. And as always, we greatly appreciate you all showing up for this and we hope to see you for more events, such as the movies The Prince's Theater and our own theater productions here at Rome State. So, here we go. Is that good? I don't know. Let's we'll see. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about France, specific region in France, and an incident called the Beast of Gévaudan. Between the years of 16, I'm sorry, 1764 and 1767, the Gévaudan region of South Central France had an issue, a terrible beast, supposedly the size of a cow was marauding around the countryside. First sighting came in the late spring of 1764 where a young woman reported seeing a large animal that was, quote, a wolf, but not a wolf. It rushed her, but it was driven back by her panicked bulls. From there, things spiraled out of control. Within days, 14-year-old Jean Boulet was found mauled to death near her village. She was quickly followed by another 14-year-old shepherdess less than a week later. Dozens of others followed over the preceding months, most with their throats ripped out, and the majority of the victims were lone men, women, and children. Panic began to sweep through the region. This led, being the time, to great appeals from the church, who had declared that the beast were the punishment from God. But all the prayers for mercy and forgiveness didn't do much of anything. Didn't even slow it down. And in January of 1765, Jacques Pontefax and his seven children from the village of Villeray were attacked by the beast. After several attempts, they drove it away by staying grouped together and using torches. And as the bodies mounted, the incident gained the attention of King Louis XV, who offered a bounty on the beast. After months of more deaths, the bounty did no good. So he sent Captain Dumael of the Royal Dragoons and his whole unit to go hunt the beast down. And although the captain completely depopulated the wolf population in central France, the attacks continued. The captain was relieved and recalled, and the king sent two professional wolf hunters to go deal with the problem. After a month more of death, the wolf hunters were fired and replaced with the king's own master of the hunt, who promptly went out and killed a 130 pound wolf. He declared the problem solved and went back to Versailles, washing the royal hands of the whole incident. Things were quiet for about a month. Then the attacks resumed, but this time the methodology was different. The beast was far more careful. The victims were far more isolated and farther apart than ever before. The local populace knew that when they called on the royal for royal help again, they would just ignore. They had no options. They turned to desperation by poisoning their own cattle and leaving them out as bait animals to try to get it. And just 
a simple prayer. Nothing worked. In the end, a local hunter named John Chastel supposedly shot the beast. Now, there are a lot of legends around Chastel. He supposedly shot the beast using a bullet passed from melted down metal, silver medals of St. Michael and the Virgin Mary. Is that true? Seems to have been added to the legend a little later, but nonetheless, the attack stopped. The beast was huge, according to all reports, and it was dissected by a local doctor who could not quite identify what it was. They were told that they should take it to Versailles and show the king, but for some reason, the beast cor carcass never made it, and it just disappeared. Now, how does this play out in the end? The reliable count said this unidentified beast made 210 separate attacks in two and a half years. 113 deaths, 49 injuries, with 93 of the victims being at least partially devoured. And even though the attacks ended definitively, there are a lot of questions that will likely never be answered. And what's Halloween without a good potential werewolf story? Try something different. Let's talk about these two fine, upstanding British citizens right here. The story of Burke and Hare, as a historian, lets me tell another story. So, in the 19th century, universities began to put a huge premium on medical training. Medicine was finally starting to come into its own, especially for surgeons. As a result, there was a constant need for, let's say, materials for anatomy class. Now, this was particularly problematic in Edinburgh because the local laws stated that you could only use human cadavers if they were dead orphans or hanged criminals. As a result, they had a shortage of materials. Again, this is particularly problematic for a man named Dr. Robert Knox. Knox held weekly lectures in an anatomical theater where he dissected human corpses for demonstration purposes. Notice I said weekly. With a shortage of cadavers, they turned to people they called the resurrection men. Resurrection men sort of brought corpses new life by robbing graves and funeral homes and bringing them to the medical school at Edinburgh. See, the legality of this in Scotland was a little shaky, right? It was illegal to rob the dead, but it was not illegal to rob the dead themselves. Because technically, the body didn't legally belong to anybody. Yeah, we can explore that a little more if you want, but the reality is that the way it worked. So technically, if you were grave robbing, as long as you left like the clothes and jewelry, you were fine. Anyway, <laughs> enter William Burke and William Hare. Burke was born somewhere around 1792. William Hare, uh, we don't know when he was born. We have no clue. Uh, they met. Uh, in 1827, during a harvest uh, where they both worked, they both shared a love of drinking and a hatred of hard work. So they became fast friends, and they tried a bunch of petty theft 
and other schemes to make money until they settled on being resurrection men. They delivered their first corpse to Dr. Robert Knox personally, which he paid them seven pounds, ten shillings, which was about 20 bucks. That's good money for them at that point. So they continued to do it. They, gave, they made it their vocation, selling and delivering corpses over and over again and being informed that the fresher the body, the more money it was worth. Until the point where they ran out of bodies. They were too successful. So they decided somewhere along the way that it would be easy enough, cheaper enough, and more profitable if they made their own product. They killed their victims by smothering. At first, they tried it with a pillow, but that didn't work very well. Their secondary method, and the one they used the most, was Burke would sit up, the pair would sit on their chests, and Burke would grab their mouths and their nose and hold them until they suffocated to death. They did this because it left a clean corpse. Thus, more money. Okay. By the way, in, <laughs> in England, that method of murder is still called burking. <laughs> so, all in all, over 10 months, the two lived really, really well, getting paid $50 a corpse because they're brand new. And they murdered at least 16 people in that time period, along with their regular grave robbing opportunities. That's why stop that, right? Um, until late in the year, they got into a drunken argument, and they got sloppy and their next last murder was witnessed. They were reported to the police and arrested. As soon as the inquiry began, they immediately pointed to Dr. Robert Knox. And while he wasn't prosecuted, his medical career and reputation were kind of ruined. On the other hand, as soon as they started asking questions, William Hare immediately turned on his friend. In like seconds. Now, well, we're here to talk. He did. I didn't mean, get the sentence out. Why? Because there's such a thing as the king's pardon at the time. When he turned evidence and the first one to do so gets the deal, he was completely pardoned and released. William Burke, on the other hand, was immediately found guilty on the testimony of Hare and Hang on the 28th of January. 1829. Hare was released and sent on his way, but everywhere he went he was recognized and chased down by angry mobs out to tear him apart. As a result, he had police protection everywhere he went until later that year, the police apparently got tired of this, they put him at the local docks and told him to get completely out of British territory. He disappears from history after that. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know where he went. However, Burke's story isn't over. It didn't end with his death. And if you want to know and see and maybe meet William Burke, he's standing in the entryway of the Edinburgh School of Medicine because dissecting criminal corpses was the law. <laughs> Y'all like that one? Okay. All right, good. All right. <laughs> On target. All right. Let's try something a little different. Again, because I like to mix it up a little bit. We've done werewolves, we've done kind of zombies with the resurrection men. Let's talk about this young lady, Mercy Brown. 
And once again, this is a way to carry another story. In the 1890s, New England was deeply in the grip of a consumption epidemic, tuberculosis, as we know it now, which obviously, by itself, is a major issue. Right? We're not going to agree with, disagree with that, but fear, desperation, combine often to destroy reason and logic. Fear is a corrosive emotion. It robs people of their reason. And at a loss to deal with the death toll, the people of New England in the 1890s fell back to an older belief. See, tuberculosis passed through proximity. Right? And in the 19th century, that meant family. So when one member of the family died of tuberculosis, the rest were not long for this world, usually. There was a folk belief that was resurrected here that deceased relatives were coming back as vampires to murder their loved ones. Since undead creatures are evil. That's just the way it works, right? That makes sense. We're all on board with, you know, vampires. <laughs> this panic reached its height in Exeter, Rhode Island. In 1884, Mary Eliza Brown died of TB, followed immediately by her eldest daughter, daughter Mary Olive, that same year. The next couple years saw several cousins pass away as well. And the siblings Mercy and Edwin Brown also were suffering from the disease. Tuberculosis is a horrible thing. It's scary, especially untreated. So an angry mob formed the Brown House. They convinced, I say convinced, they coerced George Brown into agreeing to sign a legal document to exhume his deceased family to discover the vampire. A local doctor was participating in this, but he was basically the guy at the back of the crowd going, hey, this is stupid, stop it. Nobody paid attention to him. That's kind of a standard. Many of your professors will tell you, nobody listens to experts. But, <laughs> the first bodies they exhumed were Mary and Olive. Both seemed to have a satisfactory level of decomposition to relieve them of doubt. Right? But when they dug up Mercy, Her body was not as decomposed as they felt it should be. The poor suffering doctor in the back did happen to point out that they buried Mercy in the winter and the ground was cold and she hadn't been dead that long. So that might have something, to, but no, that doesn't matter. Since she was less decomposed, obviously we have the vampire. Mercy was decapitated, dismembered, her heart was removed, her liver was removed. Both, her, both of those organs were burned, and she was dropped in an unconsecrated hole outside of town. They later got her back. But then, villagers, in a moment of pure logic, burned her heart and her liver use the ashes to make a tea that they force fed to her brother Edwin to free him from the curse of the vampire. Do I really have to say that didn't work? It, it, it did. Edwin passed away a month later. His long-suffering father, George, never contracted the disease. 
why they didn't suspect him on Oshawa, but he never got it. He actually lived until 1922, long enough to see the invention of a tuberculosis vaccine that would have saved his family. the world to Morocco. I'm talking about a man named Hajj Mohammed Mesfoui in 1906. The first part of this story is easy. Mesfoui was, to put it quite simply, a serial killer. Uh, one of your, an early one in modern, the modern 20th century, he operated out of Morocco, here, and this is the market in Morocco, by the way, at the time where he worked at a shoe and stationery store, where he and a seven-year-old woman, woman made a, named Anna made a living by selling shoes and providing, uh, taking dictation for letters that would be sent out, both in English and Farsi and Arabic. Many young women would come to the shop to dictate their letters, but a large portion of them never left. While they were dictating, they would be drugged, robbed, and decapitated with a dagger. The robberies were actually almost inconsequential, with some of the sums being taken as little as 10 cents. Over time, they found when he was caught, because one of the women's family tracked him tracked their daughter's movements to that shop. In the wall of his shop, they found 16 women and another 10 buried in the garden home. No, I'm sorry, there were 20 buried in the garden home. He killed 36. My dyslexia got the better of me, sorry. Uh, he killed 36 women. Now, that story's horrible enough. Let's talk about what actually happens to him afterwards. He's caught, he's tried, he's arrested, and he's sentenced to death by crucifixion. But Morocco is in the grip of modernizing and global outcry over the execution method of crucifixion convinced them to reevaluate his sentencing. So they sentenced him instead to beheading. <laughs> However, the people of Morocco really hated that. They felt that he had not suffered enough and that beheading would be too quick. So to make them feel better and prevent a riot, they would march him out of his cell every day for four weeks, they march him into the center of the market and give him 10 lashes from a thorny acacia rod. March him back to his cell, do the whole thing next day. But that still wasn't enough. When it came time to behead him, they reevaluated his sentence again. And this time, it stuck. Masons were called excavated a hole in that market wall right there. The hole was 16 inches deep and 6 feet tall. And they took Mesfili to the wall. They chained him in place as the crowd threw excrement at him. And they walled him up alive. And the crowd stood there for days, listening Every time he would scream, they would cheer. Until the second day, when he went silent. Many in the crowd, hearing nothing more from him, felt great disappointment that it was over so quickly. Yeah. Oh, that one was great. 
great, right? <laughs> Back to America. <laughs> June 9, 1912, in Valeska, Iowa, Iowa, not Ireland, Iowa, the Moore family and two guests attended the Youth Day program at the local Presbyterian Church. They headed home about 9.30 that evening, returned to their home, and all tucked safely in their beds. Here they are. The next morning, their neighbors did not see them out and about doing chores came by to see what was wrong. It did not go well. Josiah, 43, Sarah, 39, their four children, Herman, 11, Mary, 10, Arthur Boyd, 7, Paul, 5, and May, and Gertrude Stillinger, aged 8 and 12, respectively, who were invited to stay over for <coughs> were all found dead. The investigation kind of revealed what happened. Doctors examined the corpses and found that they, they had died somewhere between midnight and 5 a.m. And as they pieced things together, the picture became a little more clear. Used cigarette butts in the attic demonstrated that the killer had waited patiently in their house for them to go to bed. And then went downstairs where he went to the master bedroom and using the blunt side of an axe bludgeoned Josiah to death. As Sarah woke up, he used the sharp side on the axe to murder Sarah in her bed. The attack was so vicious, there were scuff marks on the ceiling where he was swinging the axe with such violence. He then went to the children's bedroom and murdered, bludgeoned Herman, Mary, Arthur, and Paul together before going back to the master bedroom to rain more blows down on the parents, before finally going downstairs to the guest room, where he murdered Diana and Lena Stillinger. The killer then went to the kitchen, rested the, the axe on, on, on the counter, got himself some water, took a side of bacon out of the icebox, and made himself breakfast before leaving the house. Police investigation, to say the least, was sloppy. Well, it looked at the date, right? But it's even worse because the police drug in every drifter and every random person in town and paraded them through the house in the murder scene, handing each one the axe to see if they were tall enough to scrape the ceiling with it, thus hopelessly contaminating the murder <coughs> weapon and the crime scene. Several of those drifters, weird folk, to be honest, but all had alibis. They were tried and exonerated. This has never been solved. But in the great tradition of Americans loving everything horrible, a tradition which we're kind of honoring tonight, it's now a tourist attraction. <laughs> All right. We've had a vampire, we've had some zombies, sorry. <laughs> had a serial killer, axe murder, we're back in the 100,000. Time for a ghost story. This is the SS Uran Madame. The oceans are full of creepy stories of ghost ships 
but the story of the Madan stands out for several reasons. In 1947, off the Straits of Malacca, several ships in the area received a series of strange Morse code and radio messages. They were punctuated by SOS calls and garbled verses of indecipherable Morse code. But let me give you the exact transcript of the message. I want to be clear what this is. It's a little weird. <clears throat> we float. SS, SOS, indecipherable Morse code. All officers, including captain, dead in chart room and on bridge. SOS, more nonsensical Morse code. Probably the whole crew dead. Indecipherable Morse code for approximately 10 minutes, followed by the message, I die. End. That's creepy enough. No more was heard from this ship. But several ships responded, including an American ship called the Silver Star that got there first. They responded hoping to perform a rescue. But when they get there, they found a rather horrific mystery. The ship and everyone on it is dead. The corpse is strewn about the ship here and there with looks of horrible frightened agony etched into their faces, but not a mark on any of them. The crew of the Silver Star reported feeling a deep and unnatural chill about the ship, even though the outside temperature was 100 degrees that day. Uh, although I think we can all agree there's some pretty solid psychological reasons for that feeling, just to be clear, right? Um, the star attached a rope to the Madame to tow it in, but as they were doing so, a crewman on the star noticed smoke rising from the number four cargo <coughs> hold on the Madame. Not knowing what its cargo was, they cut the line and got away from it just in time when this ship exploded with such force it lifted itself out of the water by reportedly 20 feet and immediately sank. Mystery gets weird because when you investigate the ship, it's completely unregistered. No ship by this name exists. This leads many people to theorize they were smugglers. But what were they smuggling? There's a bunch of theories. Um, one is that they were smuggling potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin that reacted with the seawater and thus killed the crew, maybe. Uh, another theory is based on where they were, that they were smuggling elite, uh, Japanese nerve agents from <coughs> 731 for disposal later, since no official ship could do that. And maybe that's what killed them. Uh, more natural. One thing is true, though. With the creepy radio message and the unresolved nature of this, the Madame will re remain a fascinating mystery and one that literally can't ever be solved. Y'all having fun yet? <laughs> Let's try something completely different. This is Pope Pius XII. It's a very different story. There's no mystery here. None at all. Only incompetence. <laughs> Pope Pius was the leader of the Catholic Church from 1938 until his death in 1958. His reign had many, many, many controversies in it, but I'm not going to talk about a single one of them. I'm actually here to talk about his death. See, when a pope dies, there's a bunch of pomp and circumstance that goes on around it. They build a giant, the pope's body lies in state, they have to parade it through Rome. They have a certain set ritual when a pope dies. But Pope Pius here left specific instructions 
that he be buried as God made him. So standard embalming was not done when they left the organs where they were. Instead, the Vatican used a guy named Dr. Ricardo Galizzi Lisi for the task. Now, let me be honest about Galizzi here. He'd been working for the Vatican for a long time, but he was known everywhere else as a quack. He was not a good doctor. He was horrible, in fact. What he was, unfortunately, he was an even worse mortician. He was in charge of dealing with the Pope's body and in a unique procedure where he anointed the Pope's body with oils, resins, and herbs, those that he said would recreate the funeral rites of Jesus. Uh, then he wrapped the body in several layers of cellophane and let it lie in state. It, it was a, a really warm summer in, in Rome, and, and the Pope's body lied in state for four, four days, wrapped in cellophane. And when they moved him for the funeral procession, his body exploded with a wet bang. <laughs> the Swiss guard, normally unmovable and unperturbable, passed out. <laughs> Along with the mourners that were nearby from the indescribable stench from this moment. In fact, the guards from that point on, they still had to guard the Pope's body, could only do it in 15-minute shifts. As in further indignity, the Pope's skin turned a greenish black, and his finger, all his fingers and his nose fell off and onto the floor. Needless to say, Dr. Galizzi was permanently banned from the Vatican and any church property and anything to do with the Catholics ever. <laughs> it's a short one, but it's good. I'll, I stand by it. <laughs> All right. I started with a monster story. Halloween is full of creature features. So I thought I'd give you a real one. In the Republic of Burundi, on the Ruzizi River, there's a crocodile. His name is Gustav. <laughs> been prowling this river, and he has killed over 300 people. He has achieved legendary status for, well, kind of obvious reasons, right? But the story is exacerbated by his sheer size. This is actually him. While he has never been captured, the estimates are that he is more than 25 feet long and weighs in the neighborhood of over 2,000 pounds. If you would like a size reference, oh. um, <laughs> I said real monster, did I not? <laughs> in fact, they estimate, and this is a small one, right? He, he's about eight feet longer than It's his very size that they estimate is why he eats people. He's too big and slow to catch zebra and gazelle. So instead he has turned to alternate prey, us who are slow, and full-grown water buffalo and the occasional hippopotamus. <laughs> he also has several other notable features. He has three bullet scars on his body, no one knows where those came from, and a steep slashing scar on his left shoulder that make him relatively identifiable. 
um, he's also thus far been incredibly skilled at avoiding all attempts to trap it. He just isn't there when they try. <laughs> to make things worse, <laughs> at, investigators and biologists have suggested, at first, based on his size, he must be a hundred years old. But, as you can see from the picture, Gustav has all these teeth. A hundred year old crocodile wouldn't. And some of those teeth are new. That makes him probably around 60. Meaning he's got another 50 or so years left in him. So prowl the Parisi River. If you want a little advice, please avoid that river. And there you have it. Real horror stories so far. We, as people, as Americans, we love being frightened. We do it to ourselves. Not every fight, but we do. I mean, people like roller coasters, right? <laughs> Scary movies, haunted houses, take your pick. Even if it's cutesy, right? We have these moments where we add creepiness to cute things because some inner part of us, it just appeals to us. Or real stories scare us as much or more. I mean, we're fascinated with serial killers. And when we don't have those, we create our own. Of ghost stories. We love, sometimes it's so annoying, laying awake at night and listening for that noise you thought you heard. And that's part of why this season is awesome. Right? It gives us leave to enjoy something we usually hide in ourselves. Right? Well, some of us are naturally weird, but you get the idea. So, at this point, I leave it open to, well, first, do we have a winner? Yeah. Okay, let's announce our winner, and then I'll open the floor to questions, because I love those. That's not sarcasm, I actually do. Who do we have? That'll save my books. Do y'all like those? Come back next year, I have a whole different set. I actually have a notebook of 80 separate real historical horror stories to draw on for the next few years. So. I got 10 years worth of these. After you, you ah, did the work. Right, we had um, several that had quite a few votes, but the winner by a pretty substantial margin is number three, the Van Gogh pumpkin. Awesome. Did anybody actually do this one that's here? Is our artist here? No, we didn't figure. Uh, they have they have the list of entrants, but she was sick and had to go. So we will make sure the prize gets to them. But that's actually really creative. I thought it was pretty good. So who's second? I'm just curious. Uh, second was number ten on the very end down there. Oh, a, lot of, a lot of corpse frog facts. Awesome. All right. So. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. You are more than welcome to do so. Questions, thoughts? I'm open to bring them up. He's quick. Yeah. The first one is about the beast of uh, what Yehudan. Yeah, that one. Could it possibly, possibly be a creature that has thoughts of been extinct? Like maybe a hyena dog? There are a, a lot of dog? there are a lot of theories about that. Um, the logical one that a lot of people point to are Eurasian wolves moving into the area. Uh, that's nice, but the descriptions actually lean more towards a regular sized striped hyena, which are that tall. <laughs> and by the way, have the most powerful canine jaws on earth. It's like 2,200 
uh, pounds per square inch in the fight force. Yeah, they're scary. And, um, yeah. And about the about who stopped the crocodile. Yeah. Is he actually just a normal crocodile or just a prehistoric crocodile that's thought to have been extinct by the target? He's a Nile, he, he is officially a Nile crocodile. Oh. He's just a <laughs> bit of a mutant. Uh, he's he's just, special. He, hey, we've got tall people. Uh, it makes sense, right? So, yes, sir. How is our being celebrated in other countries? It absolutely is inconsistent. Weirdly enough, in Ireland, they don't celebrate Halloween. Uh, they don't actually celebrate Halloween much either uh, because the Catholic Church has been part of Ireland for so long and has had such a grip, many of the pagan festivals were erased. Right? And if you go to places like France and others, they find our tradition of having strangers come to your door for free stuff really weird. Um, on the other hand, there are lots of traditions, like in Wales, uh, what is it called? Win Afternoon, which is a, it, the Welsh need to buy more vowels than the Celts. Um, where it's a mixture of Samhain and Christmas, where uh, the chosen person wanders through town in a costume, which is a drape with a puppet horse skull, and they go to your house and they engage you in a riddle contest. <laughs> and if you can't keep up in the riddle contest, then they get to go into your house and drink all your beer. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they want. But generally, it's some for you keep for that, like we do keep beer. So well, no, they and they have a group of children behind them. There's usually cake to go with the beer and stuff. But yeah, it's a mi weird mixture of creepy and. Samhain and Christmas caroling. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of that, right? Uh, there was there's a tradition called stoling. This may sound familiar. Um, it's where the Bibles, certain versions of the Bible, say rich people can't get into heaven, right? Because they're rich, uh, and to get rich you had to be awful. So children would go from the church and stand in front of rich people's houses and sing and pray for their souls so they could get into heaven. And the rich people would reward them with cakes and treats. It, it, it's caroling. It's Christmas caroling, except it's done in this season instead, and it got moved over. So when you go caroling next time, you're in somebody's neighborhood. What you're actually doing is praying for their souls so they can get into heaven. By proxy. So there are a lot of traditions. Like uh, Russia doesn't, and the Slavic region doesn't really have them. Uh, their holidays are, weirdly enough, all fear based. Um, <laughs> Slavic legends are bad. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you about their version of Santa Claus sometime. Anyway, <laughs> um, what else we got? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. He follows up with a, although that that seems impossible with God, all things are possible. So he's not saying we're too much. I don't disagree with the sentiment. I don't. Well, let me put it this way. I don't agree with their sentiment because it's a 15th century tradition. But you know, but they, their their soul, their singing. Yes. Yeah. So Considering the rich, people, the rich people they were singing for originally were all the nobility, because they owned all the land. So well, they must have yeah. them or more than likely. Um, but I mean, clearly. I mean, I just told you the vampire story. They, misunderstanding things is kind of human nature. Right. <laughs> um, I also, yes. uh, the, the whole, well, that's an hour, tourist attraction or an accident, mm -hmm. I didn't catch what state. Iowa. Okay, I want to go. Yeah, Valeska. <laughs> 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 right. 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 yeah. The Valeska the Bales Axe Murder House. Yeah. And that, that sign I put up there is actually in front of the house. The blood. Yes? Did they ever find a motive for the axe murder to a pass? No. Uh, those of you who were here last year, 
Do you remember when I talked about the Hinterkaifeck murder? Yes. It's yes. a murder that happened in the 1920s in Germany where the killer lived in the family's house for at least a week before murdering them all with a pickaxe. <laughs> so, this, the Valeska murders aren't the only one like this. So, if they weren't on two separate continents, I'd say, you know, okay. but they never solved either one. <laughs> so, motive, serial killers don't, and mass murderers usually don't have a necessary motive, right? They do in their heads quite often, but it's not necessarily one that makes sense to us. And the Velasca murders have all the earmarks of like a, a ritual serial killer. Serial killers are all about the pattern. They have to re it's a mental illness, they have to bring these patterns to us. Yeah, uh, the fact that there's no murder, motive to me makes it worse. Uh, so, what else y'all got? Anything? Y'all good? Yes, sir? Where do witches come from? The real ones? Uh, well, that's a hard question. Now, um, question. the tradition of oh, where witches come from, the tradition of witchcraft is fuzzy, right? Uh, modern witches are a little different than they are. The new paganism of the witches. Um, a lot of witches are misunderstood in a lot of cases. They're women who are skilled at certain things, herbal medicine, others, they act as doctors, that these kind of knowledges and skills were often seen as blasphemous because you're questioning the will of God by doing so. There are also, there are also, are still the traditional kitchen. Indeed. And, and those women, and those two. Matter of two, fact, I had uh, one in my own family that didn't take words off. I did, I did too, actually. But, those are also the women that acted as midwives and the women that performed abortions. And as we all know, even in today's modern age, that can make people angry, right? There's a lot of weirdness around. Or do witches actually do magic? No, but, right? But, when you're sick and somebody can feed you some herbs and cure you, is that magic? There's an old phrase that any science that is improperly understood can appear to be magic. So, yeah. I mean, if you were in a phone or a tablet to somebody in the Middle Ages, that's a crystal ball, isn't it? We can literally see the future, long, talk long distances. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of weirdness. So somebody using roots and herbs can appear powerful and power scary. So, yes. Uh, if if he's thinking about maybe the stereotypical no. uh, movie idea image of a witch, that that is a, a modern phenomenon, primarily the creation of Gerald Gardner. He was an English civil servant that uh, when the witchcraft law was taken out the books in England in 1956, he developed the Gardnerian tradition of witchcraft, where he said that he was taught by Old Mary, uh, a witch who had, was uh, part of an underground uh, ancestral coven of witches that went back to the, uh, the Spanish Inquisition of the Times in the 13th century. And then there were several other, uh, uh, Ms. Margaret Mary and her drawing down the new book, and the mythology, the mythology of that is much like Halloween, mixed. It's a lot of different traditions, a lot of different ideas that have been lost, rediscovered, misunderstood, and mashed together over hundreds of years, right? Modern conception of witchcraft are, well, I know some Wiccans. I can introduce you. Anybody else? What else we got? Y'all are not a curious crowd. That is unfortunate. If this was my actually actually my class, I would 
threaten your grades for not asking <laughs> questions. But I can't do that to you all. So on that note, I will let you all go. I'll hang out here for a little while. If you all have questions you all want to talk about in public, you're more than welcome. I want to uh, thank uh, the people who helped with the pumpkin contest, Elizabeth Stitz and David and uh, Jennifer Fugate. I, I failed to thank all of them and, and Melanie uh, Goldebrand and Brian Wilkerson for their public relations and, making, and creating and distributing the posters. Elizabeth Pitts also helped with the posters. So I apologize for uh, failing to thank them when, uh, when I was introducing the speaker. So, and thank you all for coming.